remember in the ashes. I have it in my hands. In preparation for Bia this year, I finally decided to read An Ember in the Ashes. After I told you for weeks and weeks and weeks to read it. How long did it take me to get you to read The Lies of Lock Lamar? Point taken. So yeah, we were super excited to get our hands on this. Both of us. Right where Ember left off, Elias and Leia are running from Blackcliff soldiers through the catacombs. They're trying to escape the city to make it to Koff prison to break out Leia's brother. After a daring escape and a fateful encounter with the Commandant, they do manage to get out of the city. After which they are joined by Keenan and Izzy, who want to help them on their quest to rescue Darren. On the other side of the coin is Helen, and she's stuck as the blood shrieked Marcus. A position she wanted as much as she would want a hole in the head. But she's stuck. Marcus has ordered her to hunt down Elias and return him to justice so he can set an example of just how well Marcus is holding down the Empire Fort. Of course, she does not want to do this, but the Augurs have promised her that not only will her hunting down Elias teach her things she needs to know about the Empire, but it will also turn her into the perfect blood shrike. And then there's the whole super secret dramatic problem that Elias is dealing with, which we can't mention because spoilers, so look forward to that. But if you're an Elias fan, watch yourself. Other problems are popping up in the Empire. The Jens aren't happy about having a plebeian king for one and are plotting against Marcus. For another, the Commandant is methodically going throughout the country and killing any scholar she can find. That is, of course, unless the scholars are slaves. The country is ready for whatever revolution Leia has for them if she can reach Darren in time to learn the secrets of Marshall Steel. Elias and Lia developed a lot in An Ember in the Ashes. Lia learned that she can be courageous and clever, Elias learned how to deal with grief, and decided who he wants to be in life. They grew and changed a lot, but in A Torch Against the Night, it feels like the focus has moved on to the plot. Everything in A Torch Against the Night is focused on getting to Cough Prison and then what happens when they get there. Lia even seems to have regressed a little bit and is more okay with sitting back and letting other people lead. You kind of just feel like you already covered that. <laughs> even Commandant feels different. Where once she was this complex, intelligent, evil, and easy to hate woman, now she's been kind of reduced to this mustache twirling villain who just seems bent on being a pain in the ass for everyone. And Helen, who you really do feel for, obsesses about Elias a lot in this book, which is pretty much what she did in the last book. It would have felt a lot better if she had decided to explore her powers more and work herself into her blood strike position. While A Torch Against the Night doesn't introduce a host of new characters, there are two that really stand out and I want to see more of. The Warden and Harper. Harper is a spy for the Commandant who Helen is forced to keep close. While he does do some pretty awful things like interrogate, read, torture Helen at the command of Marcus and is loyal to the Empire, he doesn't come across as an awful person. You pretty much know that once you figure out what his motives are, whatever they are, you're gonna like him a lot more. And he might even possibly become a love interest for Helen somewhere down the line. The other interesting character is the Warden. The Warden of Koth Prison. The prison where people check in and no one checks out because the Warden is experimenting on them. Constantly. The behavioral science version of Joseph Mengel. That guy. He is completely creepy. He's controlled. He constantly monitors the ticks of people around them. He finds pain and suffering to be the ultimate revealer of truth. And he recites disturbing poetry and philosophy while he tortures people. And I want more of this guy. Having him work with or against the Commandant in the next book would be so cool because they're both so ambitious and sadistic, but they both go about their goals in such different ways. Ultimately, you want to see him die a horrible death, but first you kind of want to see him hit his stride. Lia and Elias setting out on their quest, we get to see a bit more of the world, but not as much as I would have liked. We briefly get to see a city of outlaws and a city of traitors, but we barely get a chance to get a feel for these places before we get whisked back out on a cross-country journey. It takes away from the sense of world building. Each new environment doesn't have its own particular feel. It's very much, here's a town, and here's a town, and oh look, there's a town by a forest. But there's always hope for the next book. Maybe in the next book we'll get to experience some of the places mentioned, like the Country of the Mariners or the Freelands. A Torch Against the Night mostly suffers from middle book syndrome. The biggest, most memorable events are really just reveals for the next book. Which isn't to say that this book is a paperweight, because it's not. For one thing, Tahir doesn't shy away from violence when it's necessary to the story. 
When the prison is supposed to feel horrid, it's definitely filled with human suffering. And when you encounter the effects of the scholar genocide, you feel outraged. It never feels like you're just reading the script to a snuff film, but you definitely get the impact of the brutality. For another, Elias and Helen are really put through the ringer when you look at all of the difficult situations they find themselves in. Situations that make you feel for them, and also have you rooting for them to come out on top, because the odds are stacked so high against them. And then there is, of course, the romance in this book, which progresses very slowly. Perhaps even too slow for some Elias and some Lenin fans out there. And some interestingly new spoilery concepts that are introduced, though not explained. A Torch Against the Night is not as tight as an ember in the ashes. There's less character development, less world building, and the plot is not as complex. But it's still a good read. Characters find themselves in tough situations, you still very much care for these characters in the world, and the book's enjoyable. Plus, you know, there are a couple of great plot twists and developments that will have you looking forward to the next book whenever that happens to come out. Hopefully by then we will finally get some answers to all our questions.